Let us pray. Be present, be present, O oh Jesus, our great high priest, as you are present with your disciples. And as we together discuss and attempt to discern what it means to live fully into the life to which you call us, remind us that if we'll stay out of the way, you'll show us how and give us the power to do it. All these things we ask of the Father in your name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Okay. Are you picking me up? Okay. Are y'all picking me up? Okay. Wow, bunch of you. Um, this is not, I think by the time you print the whole thing off, uh, this ends up being, I mean, the, the PowerPoint presentations, you'll, I'm not sure how helpful you're going to find them, but, but uh, oh, see, I just nearly did it. Um, the PowerPoint presentations are, I don't know, 12 pages, 15, something like that, depending upon how you print them off. If you, I think, Alexa sent them to all of you, if you didn't receive them and would like to, and what I'm talking about is the PowerPoint presentations of the class to this point, just call Alexis, who, she's my assistant, and she'll send it to you. If you've already gotten it, you can just download it and print it off as you see fit. If you're not used to printing off PowerPoint stuff, let me suggest you not print off the slides because there's like 150 slides. And so what you want to do is put, you can get, get three, six, or nine slides on a page. If you go to 12, you're not going to be able to read it. But you can get three, six, or nine slides on a page, and I would really encourage you to do that. Now, how many of you have been to this class before? Because I know this was initially, how, let me ask it this way, how many of you haven't? Okay, for those of you who are brand new to this class, it's, there's a little bit of falsity in advertising here because what we're doing, I'm finishing up a class that I thought I was finishing up on Pentecost and discovered after the fact that I wasn't. Uh, so this is the last class on the book falling upwards. But in fact, I think it will be a pretty good summary of the whole book. Uh, so let me, very briefly, the book is Pauling Upwards by Richard Rohr, Father Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R. -R. Uh, his name is on the thing I'm passing out to you right now. Uh, and it's a marvelous study of what it means to actually enter into the second half of life. Now let me also simply say, We all grow old. <laughs> we don't all grow up. And I don't mean that to sound judgmental, but I do mean it to sound like a fact, because it is. And what this is really about, ultimately, I think, is coming to understand what it means to actually grow up as a Christian. So, I want to go through these last six slides. I hope the pages are making them back. I made a hundred. I don't know how many of you there are. Uh, in fact, let me ask, if, as they're still going back, if you're a couple, if you'd take one and share, that would be kind. Uh, there are six slides. This comes out of uh, Richard's summary itself. And then on the back, I'm going to talk about conventional wisdom versus alternative wisdom. Let me just run through these slides quickly. For those of you who have been here through the whole thing, you're going to hear a lot of this is redundant. We are created with an inner drive and necessity that sends all of us looking for our true self, whether we know it or not. The journey is a spiral and never a straight line. Let me briefly share, does that make sense to most of you? You know, the idea is that all of us have an ego. We tend to think of an ego as being an organ, like a kidney or a liver or something. Ego is just both Latin and Greek. It's the first person singular pronoun. It's just We all have an I. We're all conscious of the fact that we exist. I know Doug exists. I'm standing here uh, speaking with you. My temptation is to think I'm the most important person. And there is a sense in which that's true, and I'll come back to that. But I am not. <laughs> but here's the thing. Let me tell you, well, actually, let me tell you where that comes from. Uh, my first real sponsor in 12-step actually said to me, Doug, you've got to remember you're the most important person. And he was not doing that to stroke my ego. What he was saying was, you've got to do what sustains your spiritual health 
regardless of what other people think about it. So for example, if you're an alcoholic, you have not only every right, but a responsibility to not take that first drink. You see my point. And in that sense, you're the most important person. But one of my favorite bumper stickers is, is one seven billionth about you. <laughs> in other words, part, part of the great freedom, I think, of actually entering into the second half of life is realizing it's just really not, you're just really not that important. And by the way, you therefore have a limited, you have responsibility. But you have a limited responsibility. You're not globally responsible. You're not responsible for everything that happens on the face of the planet. This is actually very liberating. Do what you can do with what you have where you are. It's enough. It's enough. Now, planted within each of us, though, I am convinced there is a profound appetite. And the appetite is ultimately for God. And this is something we've tended to forget in the last three centuries. But one of the cardinal insights of the early church fathers and mothers was that ultimately all desire is for God. And so, for example, St. Augustine, who gets lambasted a lot for stuff that he's actually a brilliant guy. He, you know, he's a challenging man in a lot of ways. But I love Augustine because more than any other church father or mother, he told us about his interior life in his wonderful book, The Confessions. And so we know from, from Augustine's own telling of his own story, this is a guy who uh, sowed his wild oats. I've always thought it's a little bit interesting. 35 in the ancient world was middle age, make no mistake about it. I've always thought it was interesting that St. Augustine <coughs> converted to Christianity and gave up, um, call it what it was, philandering when he turned 35. He also famously said, Lord, uh, change me, but not yet. <laughs> you know, an enorm enormously uh, wonderful guy to read. But he basically argues all life is premised upon desire. If you do anything, it's because you desire to do it. Even if you're enormously ambivalent about it, you've chosen to do this rather than that. And what he has makes a very simple argument. All desire, therefore, leads us toward God or away from God. And if it's leading us toward God, in Latin that word is caritas, from which comes our word charity. If it's leading us away from God, it's cupiditas, from which word comes our word cupidity, which is not a much used word anymore. But to understand what Augustine is saying, love is what? Desire. Desire is love. Ultimately, we desire, all of us, whether we're aware of it or not, union for God. In that desire lies who we truly are. If you've ever had a moment, and by the time you're 35 or 40, most of us will have had a moment like this, where it feels like the curtains have been pulled back and you're seeing the action of God in your life or in the life of somebody you deeply love, and you're just suddenly aware of how profoundly important that moment is and you want to get back there, that's God at work in your soul. And it's a virtually universal experience. So that's slide one. We are, summary, we are created with an inner restlessness and call that urges us on to the risk and promises of a second half to our life. There is a God-sized hole in all of us waiting to be filled God creates the very dissatisfaction that only grace and finally divine love can satisfy. Now I'm going to make a peculiar comment upon this. Um, I, I am loving, have loved, and will continue to love being with you as your interim rector. But of course the word interim means when you call uh, the rector who's going to serve you for the next however many years, I will no longer be the rector, and I intend at that moment to retire. Now, the best definition of retirement I have ever heard is that it's not that in retirement you no longer work, it's that you do the work you want to do. And I think that is a beautiful definition of retirement. It's nearly as good as in retirement you sleep until you've had enough. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but the first definition is a serious one, and I'm very excited about the things I'm going to be doing. 
But I have learned because I began drawing my pension. I'm not drawing my pension now. I won't explain all that. But I began drawing my pension when I left the seminary at 60. And I came into contact with a lot of people uh, just retired. And it's fascinating watching the way people are motivated when they're retired to do good things. In some cases, it's a real offering of service. And that's as it should be. In other cases, it's the desperate yearning for a legacy project. I still matter. Do you hear the difference? The first one is of God, and the beautiful thing about retirement is that, especially the more we open ourselves to the presence of the Spirit in our souls, the more we're able to do the things God actually calls us into. And oh, by the way, coincidences multiply magnificently. It's a wonderful thing. But the first way is just saying, I can still do it. And oh, by the way, you probably can't. So that's a lesson I've learned these last three years. Beware of recently retired people demonstrating that they can still do it. Because they may or may not actually be serving anything but their own egos. In contrast, don't ever think that you ever don't have gifts to share. Because as long as you're alive, God is with you, God is in you, and God has a purpose for you. So, summary, we dare not try to fill our souls and minds with dumbing addictions, diversionary, ta numbing addictions, dumbing addictions, I was thinking about television, numbing addictions, diversionary tactics, or mindless distractions. The shape of evil is much more superficiality and blindness than the usually listed hot sins. Listen to that again, the shape of evil is much more superficiality and blindness than the usually listed hot sins. God hides and is found precisely in the depths of everything, even and maybe especially in the deep fathoming, fathoming of our failings and failures. Sin is to stay on the surface of even holy things like Bible, sacrament, or church. The second half of life is about depth. It is truly and profoundly about depth. And by the way, you have the right to go there. I spoke a few weeks ago, at pointing out Scott Peck said that he thought Americans were spiritually lazy. And I first heard this from Richard and I was baffled by that because as you may know, we work more hours in a week than do any people on the face of the planet except the Japanese. We actually, excuse me, I misstated that. We work more hours than the Japanese. So how in the world can anybody call us lazy? But we're so distracted by all the work that we do that we, frankly, don't do the spiritual work we need to do with the effect that we suffer the temptation to be superficial. Doing real spiritual work takes time, even if it's only 30 minutes in the morning authentically praying. So the point, Peck's point about being spiritually lazy was that we thought we could grow spiritually by doing the same things we do everywhere else, and the simple reality of the matter is we can't. There's a difference between spiritual work and what we tend to do day in and day out as our occupation. Nothing wrong with the occupation, thing you've got to hear. Nothing, no criticism of anything implicit in this, except that you've got to be able and willing to grow as God calls you to grow. So, if you're working too hard, ironically, you're spiritually lazy. Summary. Am I doing this fast enough? <laughs> <laughs> Summary, if we go to the depths of anything, we will begin to knock upon something substantial, real, and with a timeless quality to it. We will move from the starter kit of belief to an actual inner knowing. This is most especially true if we have ever, one, loved deeply, two, accompanied somebody through the mystery of dying, or three, stood in genuine life-changing awe before mystery, time, or beauty. Now I put down there, apply to the creed, I'm not gonna take time to do that. Um, but what he's basically saying, there is a point in the human life uh, where as we grow spiritually, it's important to say, I believe this about God to be true, I don't believe that to be true. But what Christians have done for, well, since the beginning, but what we've mastered in the last 400 years is dividing over our beliefs. Now I say the creed, which begins with we believe, or I believe, I say the creed every Sunday without qualm of conscience, I believe the creed. 
But I'm here to tell you, you will search the New Testament in vain for any evidence that at the judgment seat, God wants to know exactly what you believe. What he wants to know is how you live. And a lot of people who don't have conventional beliefs are going to waltz in before some of us who are quite concerned that other people believe what we believe. In fact, one of the things I've come to understand about immature religion is that immature religion really insists upon your thinking what I think, because if you don't, you're wrong, and at my best, I'm concerned for your soul. At my worst, I'm anxious because if you don't believe what I believe, I might be wrong. And there's an incredible temptation to placing pressure upon each other in the name of religion. That is not mature religion. I've said this before, let me remind you of it again. I will not defend, counterattack, blame, or argue. Apply that to the church and think about it. Summary. This something real is what all the world religions were pointing to when they spoke of heaven, nirvana, bliss, or enlightenment. They were not wrong at all. Their only mistake was that they pushed it off into the next world. If heaven is later, it is because it is first of all now. Now, let me be very clear. Richard is not saying that he doesn't believe in eternal life. Be very, very clear about that. And rest assured, I believe in eternal life indeed. Other things being equal, I'm going to teach an eight-week class in the fall on uh, salvation. I would really, truly, profoundly, with all of my heart, believe that when our bodies die, life is not ended, life is changed. I want you to hear that. But I think it's probably a tad imprudent to wait until that moment to begin living in the kingdom of heaven. Jesus never says, do things now and at the end time it's going to be okay. What he says is, behold, the kingdom of heaven is among you now. The kingdom of God is here now. And the people who most easily accept their deaths, their own deaths, are those who have chosen to live in the kingdom now. That's what the second half is about. It's really that simple. You know, God is present now. The best way to be assured that this is not the only life is to live with God now. You hear my point? And that's this whole thing is about that. Finally, final summary. These events, I'm talking about those events when the curtains are pulled back. Let me describe what it's like to have the curtain pulled back, and I don't want to hear any specifics, but I'm just going to do a little pull. Have you ever had a moment when for whatever reason you're suddenly totally focused upon right now and you have a sense that there's a larger presence with you and that somehow you're seeing things in a way you normally don't and it's a beautiful thing. How many of you have had a moment like that? Okay, that's God breaking through. That's God breaking through. That's the kind of thing Richard's talking about here. These events become the pledge, guarantee, hint, and promise of an eternal something. Once you touch upon the real, there is an inner insistence that the real, if it is real, has to be forever. In other words, heaven, union, love now emerge from within us, much more than from a mere belief system or any belonging system, which largely remains on the outside of the self. In other words, a truly mature Christian, and by the way, the mature straight out of the New Testament, it's a variation on the word telos or teleos, and I can do a whole thing on that because I wrote a thesis on it. But the point is that mature Christian religion manifests itself in the individual soul in certain fashions. In my experience, really mature Christians, uh, somebody comes and says, I have trouble saying the creed on Sunday mornings. We'll say, well, don't. You know, join us and see where it takes you. Now, in my earlier days, I would have, won I used to teach a graduate course on the development of the creed. Believe me, I know that stuff. But in my earlier days, I would have, would have wanted to get your thinking just so. At this point, I want to know you. And I want to see where it takes you. And if you come back to me six weeks later, and you say, you know, I've thought about it a lot, Doug. I still just really can't believe all that stuff. My question's not, well, so sorry for you, it's going to be hot. <laughs> you know, 
My response at this point is, are you benefiting from being part of us? Are you benefiting from being part of us? And if you are, keep coming. I'm really not worried about what you think about the creed. You hear my point? You know, that's one of the things you hear me talk about 12 step a lot, and I finally can say why I love 12 step so much. Uh, it's, it's, it's Christianity boiled down. It's a really bad way to put that, is it's distilled Christianity. Don't, don't do that one. Too. <laughs> but it's Christianity boiled down to its basics, and the basics are not believing X, Y, and Z about God to be true, but living a life where we surrender ourselves completely to God and ask God to inform and transform our character. And remember that the word character is the Greek word for the image on a coin. That's all it is. So if you have a quarter, there's a character of George Washington on that quarter. To be of good character is to reflect God. That's all it is. And the beauty of 12-step is that it made the process so simple for people to enter into surrendering their lives to God, that God's power might act through them, that they might be able to overcome horrible addictions. But if they want to keep that, they got to keep growing. And it's the keeping growing where things really begin to blossom. So that's the summary. Now, I've got about 10 minutes left. There's no way I can get through all of this. Uh, this is 95% on the back, direct from Richard. And I asked him last time if I could use this thing, and yeah, sure. So uh, he doesn't put first half of life and second half of life on the chart that he passes out, but it's what he's talking about. And so I just want to run through this very quickly. Uh, don't worry about um, the stuff in the Bible. So the point, fact of the matter is, I, I love Proverbs, and especially the stuff on wisdom in the Proverbs is fascinating. But the truth of the matter is there are pithy little sayings about living your life well, and they have a lot in common with Ben Franklin's uh, writings. And there's nothing wrong with it. I like Ben Franklin, you know, a penny saved is a penny earned and that kind of thing. That's all good. The rub is it's not enough. And you look over on the other side, notice the second book, the book of Job. Well, you'll sometimes hear people talk about the patience of Job. If you've ever read Job, you know that he really wasn't very patient. He spends 39 chapters moaning. Uh, uh, but the reality of the matter is, he was in a pack of hurt. You know, and everything he had ever valued in his life, including his very health, he was covered with boils, as you'll remember, had been taken from him for no good reason. Well, have you ever known somebody who suffers for no good reason? My youngest brother and sister are twins. They both have incurable, undiagnosable, probably lethal diseases, different diseases. And I can assure you, neither of them deserve those diseases. They've done nothing to earn it. You hear my point? Does God love them? The answer is manifestly and profoundly. And they're able to go forward with their lives as they trust in their love. But if they spend their lives bemoan bemoaning their circumstance, it actually truncates their growth. They're 52 years old. Think about that. That's why the book of Job is on the second side. Uh, cultural wisdom, folk knowledge, uh, community good sense, what most people want and expect from religion. And let me be very, very clear. That's good. It is what most people should want from religion. Any of you who have had children know you need help in culturating the little buggers. <laughs> you know, and that is a good and legitimate thing for church to do. There's nothing wrong with the first side. The rub is, it's not mature yet. It doesn't enter into the second half. You see my point? <clears throat> That's why I keep going back to the business about, you know, Richard's thing is, after 35, success has nothing to teach, about, teach you. There's nothing sadder 
than the man or woman in his or her 70s still trying to quote unquote be a success. The time for that is over. This time of your life is very different. Use it for a different reason. So there's nothing wrong with being a success. It's just ultimately, as we age, that's not all life is about. Um, good as culturally defined will be rewarded. Evil as culturally defined will be punished. Uh, there's a win-lose plot line. Um, Usually quid pro quo thinking. Two plus two equals four. And God is primarily a judge. You know, I had a wonderful experience several weeks ago. Some of you must have been there. But I was talking about, if I describe, uh, this is hilarious. If I describe a building as many, many, many stairs, you know, a staircase is going up and you go all the way and you get to the top and there's an old man with a white beard who rewards you if you've been good or punishes you if you've been bad. Who am I talking about? And a little eight-year-old in the congregation, this was in the big top. Um, fortunately, nobody has told him, you don't do that in church, kid. You know, he raises his hand. He's, and I was just so taken back that he knew exactly what I was talking about. And I just thought, well, who am I talking about? He said, Santa Claus. <laughs> And he was exactly right. <laughs> See, Santa Claus, I'll tell you the real story of St. Nicholas at some point, but Santa Claus, believe it or not, is the God of the first half of life. If you're good, you're rewarded. If you're bad, you're punished. Well, how does Job fit into that? How does being Jewish fit into that? You see? Quid pro quo. Everything is kept in balance by, you know, you do X to me, I do X to you. You give Y to me, I give Y to you. This, frankly, it's the world of the economy we live in. And I mean that quite literally. What does a Chevrolet cost? Well, you pay an appropriate price, you get the Chevrolet. There's nothing wrong with that. But grace is free. What do you do with the fact that grace is a gift? In fact, the etymology, same words uh, in Greek and Latin. Uh, if things don't work out, somebody made a mistake. You need to blame somebody. Uh, I want to be very gentle as I go here, but bitter old men, and there are a number in my family, are often bitter old men because they still want to know who blew it. Who's to blame? You hear my point? It's just, maybe there's nobody to blame. We're going to get there in a second. Believes in logic, fairness, truth, order, and certainty. Life as being reasonable and proper. This is in every culture. And notice this. It's Freud's superego, which is not the same as conscience. The word conscience comes from two words in Latin, cum scientia, it's to know with. If you have conscience with whom are you knowing, you're knowing with God. Superego is just being real sure you do exactly what the culture wants you to do. Um, conformity to the dominant consciousness, the way, norm, the way normal, nice people think is virtue traps you inside of your small group conformity and being unaware is rewarded. Some of the times I have most ticked people off with the littlest intention of doing so, it was because if they had heard what I was saying, they would have had to expand their consciousness. And I'm gonna say more than that. But, but there's a reason on my Facebook page I put cute dog stories and old rock bands. <clears throat> forces one to be self-preoccupied, identity and security based. How do I look? How is this to my advantage here or later? Will this make people reject me? Well, a wonderful thing from that great fan of all wisdom, Ann Landers. Uh, <laughs> got this off Facebook. When I was 20, I was very, very concerned with what other people think. When I was 40, I quit being concerned with what they think. When I hit 60, I realized they were never thinking about me anyway. <laughs> 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 uh, 
confuses law, custom, and good advice with morality and God, e.g. a stitch in time saves nine, nice girls go to heaven. And this is, if you, any of you raised Roman Catholic? Okay, it's okay if you were. Raise your hand so people can see. <laughs> Have you ever heard pray, pay, pray, and obey? You know, in the old pre-Vatican II Catholic Church, the, 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 the motto for lay folk was pay, pray, and obey. And it was really that simple. Alternative wisdom. We've talked a little bit about uh, the book, the book of Job. Some of these people are really worth reading, you know, Jesus. <laughs> but notice it includes Francis of Assisi, Scott Peck, if I've noticed, Thomas Merton, Joan Chittister, for those of you who have read uh, Chittister's commentary on the rule of St. Benedict. And I, I've only got three minutes left, so I'm gonna do this very quickly. It emerges from those who have experienced a transcendent vantage point by reason of authentic God experience, the spirit descending. God becomes mercy and compassion. Judging self and others just ceases to be a big deal. Conventional wisdom fails. Two plus two equals seven. Good people suffer. And sometimes bad don't. Victims, the excluded, minorities in any sense. Wonderful book I read years ago. It's been pivotal for me. If you're a drug addict, an alcoholic, a prostitute, convict, a convicted criminal, praise God, you're closer to God than the rest of us. Because you're closer to that place where you have to rely upon God just to get through the day. Um, more ready to see life is a collision of opposites, chaos instead of certitude. Wounding leads to God and false innocence leads to self-preoccupation. We're all going to be wounded. It's going to happen. You're going to lose somebody you dearly love. You're going to discover you have a terminal disease. You're going to come to grips with the fact that you yourself are an addict. Uh, you're going to get fired from a job for no good reason. I mean, you, you know, the list goes on and on. Something like that's going to happen in all of our lives. That is the moment when we can begin to open ourselves to the presence of God in our suffering. Or we can resent it. Those are really the options. Uh, those who have met the quote-unquote transcendent vantage point can easily live with mystery, paradox, imperfection, contradiction. They know that things are not the way they seem. The conventional has already become alternative for them. Notice this. First half of life, win, lose, competitive. Second half of life, win, win, non-competitive. Doesn't matter who wins. Ultimately, everybody's winning. And this is the final thing. It seems we must necessarily start with conventional wisdom. That's okay, there's nothing wrong with it. But you can't stay there. Conventional wisdom must fail us. Jesus spent much of his time deconstructing the first so the second could appear. One small example. First century Israel, Jesus is out with his disciples. They're walking through a wheat field. They're cutting off some of the heads and eating them. The Pharisees are deeply offended because they're working on the Sabbath. Now why in the world would Jesus take his disciples out to cut wheat down? To, you know, if you ever take a hand of wheat, I worked in a grain elevator for one summer, it's the worst job I ever had. But you can take a hand of wheat and just put it in your mouth and chew it, and it turns into chewing gum. It doesn't taste all that good, but it turns into chewing gum and you can swallow it, it's very sustaining. But they had bread. Jesus was intentionally breaking the law to teach everybody how silly the law was. And he did that a lot. His whole purpose was, you're living in the reign of God now. The kingdom of God has come amongst you. Open your eyes, open your ears, open your hearts. Live there now. Eternity becomes much simpler. It is 1049 uh, blessings. Thank you.